Good morning, everyone. How about that hail? Get your attention, won't it? Did you notice what made it stop? Prayer to St. Michael. Yeah, remember that. So today what we're going to be doing is taking a little bit of a dive, and I do mean a little bit because this is a huge topic to try to cover in about 50 minutes or so, but um, this, uh, this is going to be a little bit of a dive into looking at sacred art, and I will already tell you that I know just from having <clears throat> like drawn some of this together to prepare for this that I'm already conceiving of a bigger series that would be a theme around this, um, trying to select only a number of pieces that would fit into the allotted time was a bit of a challenge. Um, and I am aware not of what I included, this is the way that you know the mind works, I'm not aware of the things that I'm in, I've included, I'm aware of the things that I didn't include. So um, so today, let's, let's do that and um, talk a little bit about about the meaning of sacred art, the purpose of sacred art. So I have to kind of begin with what the church teaches about this, looking at uh, not just the catechism, but a little bit of, about what the Council of Trent uh, teaches mm -hmm. about this. And then uh, begin sort of a dive into looking at some periods of sacred art right up to today, where we are confronted with some very new and real, uh, not just aesthetical challenges, but also some ethical challenges uh, with what we are dealing with in the development of, for instance, artificial intelligence, and where where the church may stand on that with regard to sacred art. So I've titled this The Good, the True, and the Beautiful because the concept of the good, the true, and the beautiful is one that dates all the way back to antiquity. We find it in the writings of Plato and Aristotle as three of the primary transcendent, okay, here's a fancy term, three of the primary transcendent properties of being. Now, what does that mean? <laughs> transcendent properties of being. In Platonic philosophy, the good, the true, the beautiful, these are attributes of the source of all that is. These are attributes of the, per of the, of the perfect ideal. These are attributes of something that the Greeks would have called the agathon, which simply means the good. It's the good. It's perfection. So these, these highest ideals that we talk about in, in philosophy, the good, the true, the beautiful, represent the ideal of perfection. Okay, does that break it down enough? Maybe just kind of simply there? And she's like, oh, I'm, or she's already lost me. Okay, so, so this way, when you think about how Greek philosophy influenced Christian thought, and we've talked about this in here before, you can see how this would reinforce our understanding of sacred art as we seek to show in sacred art, these ideals. That's what sacred art is intended to do, is to draw us into that transcendence. Okay, so I'm saying that CE at the end, the transcendence, and also we have transcendence, the good, the true, the beautiful, TS at the end. You got the difference in the words? I should have put a word bank up here, I already realized that. But, but we're talking about about the transcendence of God and how sacred art is supposed to draw us into that to reinforce those ideals. So, what, um, what the ancient Greeks would have called the agathon, let's make it real simple. What the ancient Greeks would have called the agathon, the source of all good, the, the, the source, of, a source of all truth, the source of all perfect beauty, the transcendent perfection is what we call God. Okay, how's that? Make it pretty simple? Good. I got a thumbs up from David. I'm good to go. Okay. The ancient Greeks believed that before there was the ordered created universe. I want to do a little bit of a quick little bit of a quick review here, but this is this is important. You'll see how this plugs into our idea of sacred art and what it does reflect to us and what it pulls us into. So I'm going to draw back on, on some of that Greek philosophy for just a moment. Christianity is infused with Greek thought. Okay, we have to remember that. To the ancient Greeks, before there was an ordered universe, which we call cosmos, right? Before there was an ordered universe, there was chaos. Now that word means the same thing in the English language, okay? Actually, both of those words mean the same thing in the English language. There was cosmos that came out of chaos, 
order out of disorder. The Greek mind understood, therefore, that the eternal force at work that orders everything, they actually had a name for it too. That word in Greek is logos. It's the force that orders everything, always bringing order, always bringing some construct out of the deconstructed or the unconstructed, right? It's always bringing order. That which we call Christ. An interesting thing about the word logos in Greek is that it also carries the connotation of being a language. Think about how we use that word today or derivative of that word today. Think about this. How do we, when we're talking about a logo, <laughs> right? Um, we talk about language being logocentric. It sort of reflects this idea that, that there is an order, an order, language is an order, yeah? So it carries that connotation of being language. And what does God do in Genesis? Have you thought about this? I hope you have. <laughs> what does God do in Genesis? Literally speaks the universe into creation. Speaks it into creation. Every creative act of God begins with he said begins with language. It begins with that. The first of these. And God said, let there be light. Right? Let there be light. There is a beautiful, rich harmony in the, of truth in this. I don't mean any, there's no pun intended there. Um, it is why John the Apostle begins, or John the Evangelist the Apostle, begins his gospel this way. It's why. It's coming directly out of this Greek understanding uh, of, of creation and wanting to convey to a primarily Greek audience who this Jesus is. It's a beautiful way to begin today anyway. Everywhere you hear the word, word, <laughs> John is writing Logos, yeah? Everybody remember this is the prologue of John's gospel. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came to be through him, and without him nothing came to be. What came to be through him was life, and this life was the light of the human race. Sound familiar? The light shines in the darkness, and darkness has not overcome it. So we have immediately this link between that eternal force that governs the entire universe, that orders the entire universe, a link between that and somehow this light, light. And hold that thought. Put a pin in light because you'll see what role it plays in sacred art. It's all, there's all a beautiful, a beautiful harmony here. I'm going to dispense with some pretty lengthy quotes from the Catechism uh, this morning. But, um, and I've taken just some excerpts of this. This is actually Fra Angelico's Annunciation, in case you didn't recognize that. Uh, the Catechism tells us that arising from talent given by the Creator and from man's own effort, <coughs> oh, I can't even read this morning. Art is a form of practical wisdom, uniting knowledge and skill to give, for, to give form to the truth of reality in a language accessible to sight or hearing. In a language, there's that word again, in a language. To the extent that it is inspired by truth and love of beings, this is important, to the extent that it is inspired by truth and love of beings, Art bears a certain likeness to God's activity in which he has created. Okay? Everybody got that? Because that's kind of an important point about this. The Catechism goes on to say, like any other human activity, art is not an absolute end in itself, but is ordered to and ennobled by the ultimate end of man. Okay. Going on. So, so to highlight that point to you, um, I hope everybody recognizes that, right? The Michelangelo's, um, yes, uh, God and Adam, the Sistine Chapel. This is an important thing to remember as we consider sacred art is that 
seems so simple we would overlook it, right? That God created man in his image. In his image, we are all created. Therefore, we seek to imitate our creator by being creative ourselves. It is a natural extension of our being created in the image of him, is that we would want to create. So man always seeks to express, uh, because we are created in the image of God, who is the creator of all, we imitate him. And this is the source of art. Whether it is visual art, whether it is performing art, whether it is literary, poetry, prose, whatever, if it is music, any form of art, that's what it is. Our creative acts as human beings express this higher source that we are created in the image of. So, the good, the true, the beautiful. Now this is actually, I'm going to talk a little bit more about this piece a little bit later uh, this morning. This is um, Christ on the storm in the Sea of Gal uh, Christ in the storm on the Sea of Galilee, which was by Rembrandt Van Ren, and uh, I've got a great story to tell you about it later. But it's really, really one of my absolute favorite pieces of art ever, uh, and I'll talk about why in a moment. But the Catechism goes on to tell us that sacred art is true and beautiful when its form corresponds to its particular vocation evoking and glorifying in faith and adoration the transcendent mystery of God. That's when it becomes sacred art, right? is when it does that. The Catechism examines this um, in the same paragraph. It goes on to say this, the spiritual beauty of God is reflected in the most holy virgin mother of God the angels, and the saints. This is da Vinci's, uh, Leonardo da Vinci's A Virgin of the Rocks. There are two versions of this. One is in the Louvre and one's in uh, the British Gallery, uh, National Gallery. Uh, but this is the version that's in the Louvre. Continuing from that line of the Catechism, genuine sacred art draws man to adoration, to prayer, and to the love of God, creator and savior, the holy one and sanctifier. And don't pieces like this do that? This is Gerard von Honthorst's Adoration of the Shepherds, um, which you know I've shared in here many times before. Every time I get to talk about Advent, I, I show this one, right? This is, this is just a beautiful, beautiful piece where a Honthorst and others of this period, the early modern period, use this uh, this technique of light. The only source of light in this painting is the infant. He is the light that has come into the world. Let there be light. The catechism goes on in this particular section uh, to more practical applications of this. The obligation of bishops, the, the catechism is very specific about this, the, ob the obligation of bishops and those in authority to not just encourage, but to promote sacred art uh, within their areas uh, of influence and, and uh, authority, and to remove those things that do not encourage the lifting up of the heart or the mind uh, to those great mysteries. Now we understand what the, ch that the church teaches us about sacred art. Um, that is reinforced again at the Council of Trent in the 16th century, and you will see why. Uh, the Council of Trent specifically addressed sacred art coming out of the Protestant movement. Uh, there was some need to do that. Uh, many of these high Renaissance masters that we all love and we can recognize immediately their works, some of them were a bit scandalous, <laughs> especially in the eyes of Protestant critics. And so, uh, and maybe quite rightfully so. So the Council of Trent addresses uh, that to bring us back to this point that it draws us to adoration and prayer, that that is its purpose. Um, so, how did this kind of develop in the church? Who are those, as the Catechism says, I, I love this quote, we are, that, that these people, there are people with talents who are moved to use the talent that is given to them by their creator more than others. I mean, I don't know about you, I've never created a masterpiece like that. Right? But there are those individuals in history who are uniquely gifted to do this. 
Uh, and again, something I want to talk about at the very end is some of these men, um, later women, women particularly true in the, in the Renaissance and post-Renaissance era, uh, who are these people who are moved and uniquely gifted to do this? Uh, and maybe the biggest question we can ask today is why? You know, why? Why some and not others? Why not all of us? Well, I would, I would suggest to you, I posit to you that every single one of us in here, while we might not be able to create a Hot Horst or a Da Vinci or a Fra Angelico, that we all have within us this creative connection to our source, that we have the desire to express. And I'm going to talk a little more about that uh, uh, as we go along, too. Um, but we create beyond what is necessary for life. We all do this in some way. Be created in the image of God, we imitate his creative action is just part of our being, uh, becoming mirrors of the divine spark that is within all of us. I've always been intrigued by something, though. We talk about, and I actually have taught an art history survey course at LSUS, and one of the things I'm always intrigued by is that, well, when do you think that man began expressing himself creatively, artistically? 20,000 years ago. The art in the caves that they discovered in France. How old are they? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've always been intrigued by that. Um, that Paleolithic man. Now, he's got to be pleased with what I'm doing this morning. <laughs> Maybe one of you in here, he's not pleased with that, but it's not me. Um, Paleolithic man felt the need to create. I've always been intrigued by that. Do you know that there are actually cave drawings? You guys both mentioned 20,000 years. The caves in France, and Chauvet is it's about 35,000 years old. Do you know that there are actually cave drawings in existence that have now been dated to 65,000 B.C.? which is Neanderthals, okay? Now, these are in a cave in France. Do you see the rhinos, rhinoceroses? These are in a cave in France, and they're only about 35,000 years old. Paleolithic man. But this is artwork. Paleolithic man felt the need to express himself artistically on the wall of a cave not just, not just drawing something that he knew in his, perhaps in his reality, but in a really symmetrical, artistic, expressive way. Don't you find that fascinating? This is an innate need that we have and we have always had, is to express something beautiful. A representation of what exists in the imagination, and that's another word I want to talk about, the ancient Greeks have a word for image. The eidos is in Greek. It means image. And it comes from our imagination. So what is our imagination? Where does it come from? What is the connection to? What Aristotle would call, actually would refer to imagination as the movement of thought. It's thought moving in us. It is something divine that moves in us, okay? The source of all. So, the imagination, we are always seeking to express, even Paleolithic man, always seeking to express the good, the true, the beautiful. And when rightly ordered, as the Catechism says, this is exactly what we experience in true sacred art. Now, please don't misunderstand. I'm not suggesting that the cave drawings in Chevet or anywhere else represent sacred art. My point about that is that they, they sort of really underpin this, this idea that we were created in the image of a creator. Okay. Christianity has gone through phases of development um, of sacred art that run in parallel, of course, with our human story, with our human history, human experience. Um, our, our social norms in every age are going to be reflected somewhat in sacred art. 
Uh, as we introduce that human component to it, it's going to express our human experience, whatever it is going on in, in that point in human history, as well as artistic techniques obviously change uh, as well. So we're going to take a stroll through this chronologically uh, somewhat. Early Christian art, medieval renaissance, and then looking at, at uh, modern, postmodern, um, did I say that word? Post, postmodern. I should tell y'all something. I'm going to embarrass him. Ben, Ben Haynes right here. Wave Ben, Ben Haynes. Ben is a former student of mine at LSU Shreveport. I'm very proud of him. Ben is uh, now a Catholic, and he is also in his final semester of his PhD program in Baton Rouge. Graduates in May, right? Yes, yes, yes. And Ben also did a field, actually chose a historical topic that's philosophical. So I would like to think that I had some tiny little influence. God used me in some little way in all of those things. All of those things, some tiny little way. Ben says maybe that much. But anyway, a little bit and all those things. So it just made me think about this, that you know, the, the conversations that you and I have had about uh, modernity and post-modernity and, and sort of the breakdown of that. So, so um, that I kind of took a rabbit trail, I'm sorry, but I did want you to meet Ben because I'm happy he's here this morning. What separates these periods uh, is more than just style. Innovation in art techniques, uh, certainly, uh, are types of pigments. What separates these periods is what's going on at the social level. What's going on in society, the culture of the faith. And one of the things I most appreciate about sacred art as a historian is it parallels the human story. And it sometimes runs ahead of it. Sometimes what we experience artistically, what's going on in our popular culture, for instance, today, can be almost predictive of what's coming. Uh, now, don't think about that too much because that's kind of scary if you're watching popular culture today. But it is a little bit predictive sometimes. Uh, what's going on with us, about us, is going to be expressed from that place of our divine imagination to point us to the good, the true, the beautiful. <clears throat> we seek transcendence in every age. Man is a transcendent being. We are always being called higher, always. Okay, early Christian art. Remember that um, the context is that early Christianity is illegal. Yes, it's illegal. Persecuted off and on for the, four, for the first 300 years of the faith and then intermittently thereafter, but, um, but certainly illegal for the first um, easily three centuries of, of our faith, so that we find it takes on a good bit of pagan imagery uh, in the very beginning to sort of blend in, to not attract attention. Uh, it is underground, and I do mean underground literally in the catacombs in the catacombs. Besides, there's also considerable debate at this time period about the role of art, um, especially in this Hellenistic Greek world, the Greek world, Greco-Roman world. There's a lot of debate about it, uh, and I want to reference Plato again and mention something that, um, that comes out of his most studied dialogue, his most studied work from, a, from a, like a literary perspective. His most studied work is probably the Republic. And um, the, the Republic depicts this perfect society and tries to define what perfect justice looks like. Uh, how do we get um, to that ideal? And it's where we get much of our Western understanding, for instance, about the quest for perfect justice. How many of you have heard in here have heard me talk about justice before? Raise your hands. Everybody should raise their hands because I've talked about this before. And that comes straight out of Platonic thought when I, when I reference that. It's where we get our idea for this. For instance, the Christian church is even modeled on the hierarchy of the republic. Um, our, the university I teach in is modeled on the um, Plato's Republic. Every Fortune 500 company has a hierarchy uh, that's modeled on that. So informed partially by that, and also because, remember, in the, the Jewish faith, one does not even speak the name of God. Remember that? Does not even speak the name of God. There's some discussion about this. Can Christianity find expression in artwork? Is it okay to depict Jesus in art? Is it okay to depict the stories 
uh, of the Bible, the gospel narratives, the parables, is it okay to depict those in art? There's a lot of discussion about that. And we know that actually because of some, some letters that exist. For instance, Constantine's sister wrote a letter to a bishop asking the question, is it okay that I have an image of Jesus? So, so we know that there's, there's some controversy about that. The largest group of early Christian paintings come from the tombs, the, the, the catacombs of Rome, uh, and sort of show the evolution for us of the depiction of Jesus, a process that is not complete until the 6th century, when Christianity is not only legal, but I'm going to show you, we have the first image of Christ that is probably, uh, as well, not probably, it sets the model, it sets the standard for every uh, image of Christ we have after that. Some of you may have heard me give that talk on from the catacombs to Caravaggio, where we talked to look just specifically at Jesus, just specifically at him, uh, not all sacred art, but it has remained remarkably consistent since about the sixth century. We sort of have to begin in the catacombs here again. The catacombs, everybody know what that is? The city of the dead. It literally means, the catacomb literally means next to the quarry. That's what it means. Uh, it comes from the fact that the first excavations to be used as a place of burial were carried out on the outskirts of Rome next to the site of a major, of a large rock quarry. But the catacombs actually possess a large number of subterranean passageways too that connect some of them. Uh, and there are, I believe, only five of them, I think, that are open to the public, maybe today. But um, you can, you can go there and see some of them. Roman law at the time prohibited the burial of deceased in the interior of the city. So for that reason, this is all originally located outside the walls of the city. So Christians were free to bury their dead among the pagans in this necropolis in the city of the dead. But many of them, of course, chose to use Christian, early Christian imagery uh, as, as sort of a way to honor the dead. Uh, in Rome, as I said, these 60-something catacombs, this is actually one that hopefully you can recognize. Who is that? Jesus, Jesus the good shepherd. good shepherd. Jesus the good shepherd. Doesn't he just kind of look like a young Roman man? Mm -hmm. well, look at this. There's another one. Third century. Third century. Okay. So while the Gospels do not provide us with a physical description of Jesus, we can be almost 100% certain he did not look like this. <laughs> okay? Um, they, the, the Gospels do offer us many figurative descriptions to, to describe him, though, right? One of those most popular ones is Jesus as the Good Shepherd. So you see him depicted here as a young Roman man. Uh, you can't really see it in this one. You can see it a little better in this one. Wearing a Roman tunic. Dressed as a Roman man, short hair, no beard. Um, and perhaps the most striking one, um, striking reference we have to that, you know, comes from John. Go back to John's Gospel again. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. So it's not surprising that many early Christian uh, artists in the catacombs chose this particular depiction of Christ. And why, 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 why? Why these depictions of Christ? It also helped them avoid persecutions. If there are, have any Roman officials strolling through the catacombs and they look upon these images, it's that they're not going to connect. Some of them are overtly pagan. And this doesn't stand out in any way that would draw suspicion. This one. Anybody want to guess what that is? Yes, yeah, the Adoration of the Magi. It is, third century, third century adoration of the Magi. Um, and this one, of course, is all, this is found in the catacombs of Priscilla. Also in the catacombs, you want to identify this scene? The hemorrhaging woman reaching out just to touch the hem of his garment. But again, is there anything here that would alert a Roman authority that this was something subversive? Like? Christianity. They don't know the Gospels. They don't know the stories. They don't know the, par the, the parables. So, so often this took on this, this thing, we think, because it avoided persecution. So it sort of serves these two purposes, really. 
Um, some art, I think, is particularly inspired. Let's leap forward to the 6th century. The Pantocrator literally means he who has authority over everything, or another way to think of it is a ruler of all, Pantocrator, usually translated simply as almighty. When the Hebrew Bible was translated uh, into Greek, the Septuagint, um, the Pantocrator was used both for, for two Hebrew words. It was used for Yahweh, and it was used for um, El Shaddai. Okay, Pantocrator, the Greek word, is substituted for both of those words, Yahweh and El Shaddai, the Jewish words for God. In the New Testament, Pantocrator is used once by Paul in 2 Corinthians uh, and nine times in the book of Revelation. Pantocrator. This image of Christ is quite well known in Western Catholicism and in Eastern Orthodoxy, perhaps not so much in Protestantism. Is it as well known? Um, but this becomes the model for future depictions of Christ. So everybody sees the difference between uh, what, we've, what we've leaked from in the 3rd century to the 6th century? Could that even be the same man? But this became the model. And, and to a point I want to make in just a little bit, we don't tolerate much of a deviation artistically from this standard. Did you know that? Anybody look at this and get, go, oh my gosh, I wonder who that could be. <laughs> so we don't tolerate too much of a, uh, of, a, of a difference from this, but it becomes the standard and the model, and you see it really beautifully again here. This is the one in Hagia Sophia in Istanbul which is a little bit later. So you have, um, you have this sort of thing that will continue on then with Jesus and art that we talked about in that other series I did, um, Catacombs to Caravaggio. So you can go back and look at that again if you wanted to. The Middle Ages, much of the art that survives from Europe in the Middle Ages after the fall of the Western Roman Empire is Christian art. This is the reason you don't see much art that is anything, you don't see sectarian art. You don't see just basic like civil art in places, um, rarely because uh, remember that with the collapse of the Western Roman Empire and the collapse of that imperial authority, the church steps into the role of authority and therefore the church becomes the dominant cultural force. They're driving the art and also deciding which art survives and which art doesn't. So, so we don't have a lot of art from the Middle Ages that is not religious, and uh, its primary pur purpose, now look at this. Would anybody look at this and say, oh my gosh, what a beautiful painting. Mm. The good, the true, the beautiful. Okay, the good and the true. <laughs> well, look, look what's going on here. First of all, the purpose of medieval art is to convey religious meaning only. It's only to convey religious meaning. It's not particularly interested in rendering, like accurately rendering people or objects or landscapes with any kind of proportion or perspective. Many times we don't even know the artist, although by the high and late Middle Ages that begins to change. But if you want to think about it, you know, realistic perspective, things like light and color, um, those are all pretty much ignored in medieval art in favor of very simple messages that reflect a truth to a rather simple audience, to be honest. The controversy over the use of graven images uh, the interpretation of the second commandment and the crisis that we see when there is an iconoclasm going on in, in the eastern part uh, of the eastern church. Uh, Constantinople begins destroying images, destroying icons, destroying artworks. Uh, that kind of led to a standardization of religious imagery within the eastern church, but the western church really loses the, that perspective uh, during the high late Middle Ages. So we're from about, I would say from about 1,000 to about mm, the coming of the Renaissance. We could argue about when that begins. But 
for at least a couple of three centuries, we lose that kind of perspective. So definitely in the Middle Ages, you see that there's this shift to take on very simpler expression, not much care to detail, to things like, you know, people's faces, the human form is often not depicted in any sort of symmetrical, uh, anatomically correct way. To convey to people a simple message in a way they could simply understand. Remember that the medieval church is a book. Why is it a book? Well, most people don't read. <laughs> with the collapse of the Western Roman Empire, this is not true in the East, but with the collapse of the Western Roman Empire, you do see this loss of literacy and learning. Uh, although it is not a dark age, please don't ever use that in my presence. It's not a dark age. The, the church actually keeps the light of learning burning. Uh, but, but you do see more of a shift toward being able to tell the stories artistically to people. If you walked into a medieval church, and many of us have done this, you walk into a church that's built in the high Middle Ages and you look around and it is full. As a matter of fact, it's almost an assault to us today, an assault to the, to the site to have to try to take in everything. You know, you've got the seven deadly sins represented somewhere. You've got the Holy Family. You've got scenes from the entire Bible depicted in some way so that people can read it and understand visually. And we kind of lost that today. We don't need that today perhaps as much. But it served that purpose of conveying the good, the true, and the beautiful to people uh, in, their, in their own way. The Middle Ages, interestingly, because sees an emphasis on suffering, oh, I wonder why that would be. <laughs> why would the Middle Ages be concerned with suffering? You know, in an, in an age that witnesses war, plague, famine, you know, they're playing chess at the highest levels of the Christian church in some epic kind of scramble to decide who's going to be pope. So, so there, there's an emphasis on, on suffering. The suffering of Jesus gives meaning to our suffering. And you see much more of an emphasis on this in medieval art than you do in later forms of art. Uh, overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly the depictions in art are of the passion or the lamentation or the man of sorrows. Uh, the sor Seven Sorrows of Mary begins to be expressed a lot more in art during this time period. Lots of emphasis on suffering. And then, at least that book ended the life. Now, the other book ended his life. There are people like St. Francis of Assisi who were introducing nativity scenes, which is kind of cool, right? We have St. Francis to thank for that. But it is also, think about what a nativity scene is. It's a visual way to tell a story <clears throat> to people who might not be able to read it. So we see that in the Middle Ages, sacred art expresses the good and the true, for sure. But maybe not always the beautiful. But, but remember, I guess it's in the eye of the beholder, right? Okay. One rich treasury of medieval art that we have is in illuminated manuscripts of the High Middle Ages. And uh, this one actually is from the Book of Kells, which dates to the 8th century. The 8th century. Uh, comes from, uh, it's Celtic, a Christian in origin. It came from a Columban monastery, one other, in other words, that followed the tradition of St. Columba. It's sometimes called the Columban Gospel, except that St. Columba actually predates it by uh, a couple of centuries at least. But what you see is, in here, it's interesting about this. Anybody ever seen the Book of Kells? Yeah, it's in Trinity Library in Dublin. It, um, it actually uses this unique kind of combination of Celtic pagan symbol, symbolism and also Christian symbolism still reflecting kind of that crossover that's going on there and the text is Vulgate Latin the text of it is Vulgate Latin but it uses this distinctively Celtic pagan kind of art motif so it's really really fascinating my point being of this one I just chose one to show you is that the Middle Ages produces a rich treasury of this to me, these are some of the most beautiful works in any age, is to look at an illuminated manuscript, the detail that went into doing that. Then we have the Renaissance, <clears throat> a period when many art scholars would say sacred art reaches a peak. Some would say maybe not so much. Um, certainly it is a significant transition and a significant turning point, uh, regardless of which way you look at this. 
uh, as the Renaissance sought to reach back and reclaim some of those classical principles of art, some of those those classical uh, ideals of, I don't know, perspective, right? People look like people. Symmetry, harmony, things that we achieve, can achieve artistically, and the perfection of the human form. I don't think there's been a time in history, perhaps, if you can look to antiquity, the Greco-Roman understanding of the classical depiction of the human form. You don't see it expressed any more beautifully in any age than in the Renaissance. The human form. So the Renaissance, of course, comes about because you've got many people with wealth who are art patrons, especially in Italy for reasons we could talk about that would take too long. But it, depend, it begins, especially in Italy, for very specific uh, so, sort of uh, economic and political reasons. But this was the period of the great masters, and it was a time when man was elevated. Man is elevated. Please keep in mind when I say this, we talk about the elevation of man, humanism. We're not talking about a demotion of God. Just because man is elevated in the Renaissance doesn't mean we've demoted God. Does that make sense? Um, but an elevation in the sense that there is a focus on, on the human being as being in the image of God. To focus on our humanity in its perfection, just as we are. Um, a time of humanism. This is Raphael Sanzio's um, School of Athens, which is in the Vatican Museum in Rome. It originally hung in the Apostolic Library. Uh, but... Um, the great philosophers. This actually illustrates the point I, I started with. I wanted to show this to you for a very specific reason. Because this expresses the church's understanding. This was done under the commission of the church uh, by Raphael Asanzio. It expresses the understanding of the church, the universality of these ancient philosophers. They're all pre-Christian, but they all bring a universal truth. And the church recognizes that at, at this sort of clear return to the classical principles of, of, of art you see as well. Now, what, what you see here is a, um, I'm not sure what you call a gathering of philosophers. A gaggle. A babble uh, of philosophers. And, uh, and actually, if I had my key with me, I could pick out some of these. I know that um, he's depicted he's depicted himself, uh, Raphael depicted himself somewhere actually, if you couldn't see it anyway because my pointer's not working. Uh, somewhere over here in the, in the right, you have also Michelangelo uh, who's depicted here. Uh, and right at center, that you, that's where with the, the, your linear perspective, where your eye goes is to the center. And oh, by the way, this is, these are all depicted under the dome of St. Peter's Basilica. That's where they're all gathered. This gaggle of philosophers are all gathered under the dome of St. Peter's Basilica. But right at the center, uh, where your eye goes, you see um, to the left, the figure on the left, the old man with the beard, right? You see Plato. And next to him, on your right, with the blue, is Aristotle, his student. They're right in the center of this school of philosophers. And if you look at this more closely, and we could, this would be fun to do uh, maybe at some future time, but I, what I love about this is it, and I show this to my philosophy students, very simple illustration. Plato is doing this, <laughs> pointing up, come higher, Aristotle's doing this. Like he's, somebody asked me, well, is he dribbling a basketball? <laughs> no. In other words, the focus of Plato is this, transcendent ideal, and Aristotle is more, well, it's, it's right here in the physical realm that we can measure, too. So my point of showing you this is that the church at the peak of this renaissance recognizes the incredible contributions, the universality of thought of the good, the true, the beautiful, that these philosophers contribute to us. These principles find expression in works such as this one, The Last Supper by Leonardo da Vinci. This isn't the first Last Supper. <laughs> I didn't mean for that to come out that way. This isn't the first Last Supper that, um, that was ever created. It's actually not an uncommon theme in the late Middle Ages to see uh, a Last Supper depiction. 
But it is, it is the most studied from an artistic view because it incorporates all of those lost classical ideals, the principles of the ideal forms uh, that the Greeks so valued. We see the return of linear perspective. So if you look at this painting, and I don't know that this would be a universal thing, but I'll ask you. Um, everybody look down. Don't look at the painting. <laughs> now look up and tell me where your eye immediately goes. I got heard something different over here. It's okay. What, what, where did your eye go? Christ. Does everybody think it's Christ? I don't see. I don't think so. Okay. It goes to the background. Your eye is drawn over Christ's shoulder to the landscape behind him. And actually, more specifically, probably over his right shoulder. You see how Leonardo da Vinci created what we call, this is an inverted pyramid, but our inverted golden triangle. Do you see it between me and John? John is seated to his right. There is this sort of inverted, that's a, that's a classical principle, to draw your eye somewhere. Um, now, I know we all want to say Christ because we know that's Christ and we feel badly if we say, I'm not looking at you, Jesus. I'm looking at that beautiful landscape behind you. But, but it really is something that Leonardo da Vinci reintroduces, this idea of the classical, uh, the, 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 the golden triangle, as Aristotle would call it, the, the, the pyramid of things being represented in a three, three-sided, three representing perfection. The Trinity, however you want to think about it, right? It incorporates all of these ideals. So now the High Renaissance um, features images like this that focus on the on Jesus as a real human being, using human ideals of, of beauty uh, and aesthetics. But this one, this Last Supper, captures a purely human moment. Now. I have to say, Jesus, and, and please forgive me for the way this is going to sound, artistically, Jesus is the least interesting person in this painting. And that's deliberate. Because da Vinci wants you to look at who? All of the apostles. All of the apostles who have just actually just heard Jesus drop the bomb. What is the bomb? One of you will betray me. So da Vinci is interested in the reactions of the apostles, not Jesus. From left to right, Bartholomew, James, and Andrew. They're grouped in threes, by the way. You notice this? <laughs> the apostles are grouped in threes. Bartholomew, James, uh, Andrew, beginning from, from the left over there. Uh, Judas, Peter, and John. Then there's Jesus. Second grouping. Thomas, James the Greater, and Philip. And the next group of three on the other side. And then you have Matthew, uh, Jude, and Simon the Zealot there on the end. So you'll notice that they're all engaged in some kind of conversation. There's some kind of incredulity going on. Uh, which one of you is it? <laughs> And if you look across the, 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 the horizontal plane of the painting, beginning from the left, look all the way across the left to the right, who is the lowest figure? Judas. Again, a deliberate artistic choice to do that. Now, I could talk about this all day, but I don't have time. Okay, so let's look at this beauty, Michelangelo's uh, Pietà. The Pietà, 1498. Again, the classical principles of beauty are at work. Classical principles. Seeking perfection in the human form. Do you see the pyramid? Do you see the triangle? You see the triangle? Threes. Um, the, the sort of the statue widens as you get toward its base, progressively down the kind of the drapery of Mary's dress, uh, disappearing into, anybody know what they're sitting on? The Rock of Golgotha. This is the Rock of Golgotha. The figures are quite out of proportion, which is interesting that it's probably not the first thing you notice.
but it's out of proportion. Does everybody realize how large Mary is? But, but Michelangelo made a deliberate choice to do this because she's cradling her son in her lap that she wanted to give this perspective of her being able to hold Christ in her lap. It sort of requires that. Just probably the weight of the marble alone required that. Uh, and it differs from all other representations um, of the Pietà. This one does. Because Mary is young and beautiful. She doesn't look like the probably 45-year-old or so, 46-year-old she might have been. Uh, Michelangelo uh, made a, a deliberate choice to depict her as a young woman. Again, going back to sort of those classical ideals of beauty. Now, we could talk a lot about, so much about this to talk about, especially theologically, and that's why I want you to put a pin in all this, because we're going to come back at the end and talk about another series. But... Um, one of the things I love about this is, um, first of all, to stand in front of it. How many of you have seen it? You've seen it in St. Peter's Basilica? You stand in front of it and you realize that Michelangelo once stood in front of a solid block of marble and saw this. He saw this. What kind of person does God choose to do that? In this case, a man with a horrific temper. <laughs> okay? <laughs> Because the, the story about, about the, the Pietà is um, that when it went, first went on display in Rome in another location, he overheard, uh, it was the gallery opening, he overheard another artist attribute the work to someone else. So he broke into the gallery that night and he carved a sash right across Mary's chest, which is visible, you can see it, carved across right, a, a sash right across her chest that says Michelangelo Buonarroti Florentine made this. <laughs> it's the only work he ever signed. Uh, it's actually a, a post-Trent um, artist by the name of Giorgio Vasari who tells us that story that, um, that Michelangelo's temper, it was his temper, it was his pride that got in the way. Okay. Make a note about the temperament. So I'm going to come back to that. This is a time when, again, a Raphael Sanzio is capturing the beautiful Madonnas, but also a human, very cherubic-looking Jesus, little baby-fat Jesus. And this is actually the Madonna of the Goldfinch. So you see John the Baptist there. Uh, Mary's right hand is on John the Baptist, uh, Jesus to the left. John is holding a goldfinch, a goldfinch being a symbol of the passion. Y'all all know that story? Nobody knows the story why the goldfish came to be as the gold. Goldfish. Goldfinch <laughs> came to be associated. There's actually a couple of origins of this, and I'm, I'm not sure. Um, there's a non-biblical, and by non-biblical, I mean it comes from an apocryphal text, uh, actually a, a Gnostic text. It's a Gnostic text, the Gospel of Thomas, you might have heard of that. Uh, there's a story that relates how the child Jesus was playing with some clay birds that his friends had given him, and he breathed on it, and one of them came to life. That's, just, that's a, that's a non-biblical legend, really, is what it is. But medieval, um, it was very popular in the Middle Ages and, and obviously into the Renaissance. They saw that as his al an allegory kind of of him coming back to life, his resurrection. And, um, and then there's another, um, there's another sort of a medieval legend, too, that when Christ was carrying uh, the cross to Calvary, there was a small bird. Sometimes it's a goldfinch, sometimes it's a robin, but flew down and plucked out a piece of the crown of thorns, uh, and that is why today the robin's chest is red, and why even goldfinches have little specks of red as well on their head. So this, that legend goes, anyway, the goldfinch became a very prominent theme. There's over 500 artworks, in case you're, you bird nerds like me are interested, there's over 500 artworks from the Renaissance that represent the goldfinch. Madonna of the Goldfinch. The Last Judgment by Michelangelo. This is on the altar wall of the Sistine Chapel. Remember that this period of art history runs in parallel with the Protestant movement and the Catholic Reformation. This work of art is a cautionary tale about all these things coming together. It's why the Council of Trent, one of the reasons the Council of Trent addresses sacred art. This is Jesus looking like the god Apollo. 
you remember how I told you, going back to that Pancho Proctor, that we don't really tend to, to tolerate any deviation from that standard, that artistic standard? Well, here is the God Apollo. Right. To offer full perspective, here's the full painting which was cleaned in the 1990s. Y'all, this is a true story. There was an art historian at the Vatican who simply walked by it one day. Everybody thought that it was just dark. And she just touched it and went, oh my gosh, look how dirty that is. And they cleaned it. Imagine all that soot collecting in there over centuries maybe of electing popes. I'm not sure. That's what I like to think it is. But um, not somebody not paying attention to the dusting. But it was recently, recently, it was 1990s, it was claimed, and it's this brilliant blue. But that, to offer the full perspective, there's the full painting. Now, this was scandalous because none of, the, none of the figures you were looking at were clothed. None of them in Michelangelo's original painting. And there was a, uh, a papal secretary by the name of Biagio uh, Cesina who walked by it one day and was horrified and went to the Pope, Pope Paul III, and complained that it was more fit for a brothel in Rome than it was for a papal chapel. So Pope Paul III reluctantly went to Michelangelo because he had a famous temper. And Pope Paul III was terrified of Michelangelo. <laughs> and he went to him and he suggested that maybe he could clean it up a little bit. And Michelangelo wanted to know who had complained. And he told him was the papal secretary, Jacina, Jacina's his name. And so Michelangelo said, okay, whatever. So he finished the painting, and you can find a Biagio Jacina to this day in The Last Judgment in a portrait of him. He's in the bottom right corner, bottom, very bottom right corner. <laughs> as one of the souls being tortured in hell, and he's being tortured in a very specific way, you might add, right? <laughs> he's wearing um, donkey ears, which is the universal symbol for jackass, <laughs> and that is a portrait of Chesina. Everybody knew it. So the papal secretary went back to Pope Paul III and complained again, and Pope Paul III famously told him, I am so sorry that my jurisdiction does not extend to hell. <laughs> You're just going to have to deal with it. Right. But this did lead to, after the Council of Trent, something just to, to finish that, the, uh, the Council of Trent, which is, this is one of the artworks that attracted a good bit of criticism. And um, the Council of Trent, although they could do nothing about the depiction of Jesus as a beefy god Apollo, um, they did order what's called the Great Fig Leaf Campaign, <laughs> where all of the uh, figures were covered with clothing, uh, at least partially with clothing. And uh, that was Giorgio Vasari. I mentioned him earlier. He's the one who tells us some of the greatest stories about Michelangelo and his temper. So that ushers in the Baroque period. Uh, Trent ushers this in that... Religious imagery can be contemporary. You can use contemporary clothing. You can use contemporary settings. But they, they must um, actually convey the sense of human sensuality and spirituality in a way that, um, that is not offensive, that's not lewd. And so Caravaggio captured this better than anybody. I mean, inspired an entire school of using this a chiaroscuro effect, of using lights and darks to bring together that sensual and the spiritual. Uh, everybody recognized this, the incredulity of Thomas. Yeah. You see it again in the calling of St. Matthew, that same sort of use of lights and darks, this very distinctive style. Right. I feel myself I'm having to hurry here. That's just what I was worried about. The modern period, I just chose a couple to look at. Some examples, um, well, quite honestly, that I like. This is, um, again, in the, in the modern period, you see the continuing use of lights and darks to contrast the scenes. In this way, it's kind of a reverse because you see Pilate standing in the light. But what is the question? Quid est veritas? What is truth? Pilate is seeking. Pilate is the seeker. He's all of us 
in this particular painting, Christ is kind of obscured in shadow here, uh, but this is, uh, I love this, you see, you see this use of light and dark, a, kind of a return to abstraction. Uh, and you even see the Impressionist influence on art. Y'all have seen this before. I use this one. This is Ferenczi's Sermon on the Mount from 1896, uh, Hungarian artist. I used uh, this as an illustration when I did that series on the Beatitudes because, again, you see the, some of, some of the, the classical principles, but now we're also seeing the impact of Impressionism. You are seeing uh, people depicted as they are, very human. Jesus has his back to you. He has his back to you because he's the teacher. He's the teacher. So the artist doesn't want to draw your attention to Jesus. The artist wants to draw your attention to the people who are listening to Jesus, the disciples of Jesus, the followers of Jesus. Okay. Now let's go back to this painting real quick, and I'm, I'm, I will wrap up. If you need to leave, it's okay. I understand. I said I would be finished by 10.30, and it's 10.31. <laughs> um, what's interesting is that by the 19th century, ancient and medieval art, and Renaissance, high Renaissance art even, already modern Baroque art, they're not being collected for religious purposes. They're being collected for, I mean, think about how much art was commissioned for the church and how much of that has found its way into private collections are sectarian museums. It's not really collected for religious purposes as much for their aesthetic value, for their historic value, and yes, for their monetary value. I can't let this opportunity to pass to, to mention at least uh, a couple of the greatest mysteries of the art world. The theft of the storm, of Christ and the storm on the Sea of Galilee. In 1900, this masterpiece was stolen. Uh, this masterpiece by Rembrandt, Van Ren, was stolen from the Gardner Museum in Boston, 1900. And its location remains unknown. As do the, as the identity of the thieves. We don't know who the thieves were. Uh, and this seems kind of counterintuitive to me. You know, if, if one would assume that if you have an artwork, you want to display it. Wouldn't you want to show everyone? Wouldn't you throw a party at your house and say, come look at my new Rembrandt? <laughs> it's counterintuitive. Why would you have something if you cannot share it or show it? It's baffling. But this dramatic painting is a good one to look at uh, from that early Baroque period, too, because what you see is that use of lights and dark. Do you see how the artist Rembrandt has placed Christ in the middle of the storm? But do you see how the left... The left field is the emerging light, and it's literally almost, if, if you feel as if it's pushing the dark off the, off the canvas. Right? Great hope emphasized by that. So this painting was stolen along with 12 other paintings, including a Vermeer, uh, a, a Degas, I don't remember the others, but uh, 13 paintings in all stolen by men who posed as police officers to get in, locked up the real security staff in the basement and took out of the frames so they could roll them up, 13 paintings, about $500 million worth at the time, gosh knows what they're worth today, still lost, and today the Gardner Museum, if you ever go there, it's really fun. Go to the gallery where these were stolen because all the empty frames are still hanging there as a tribute to this particular thing. This is the most stolen art piece in history. This is the Ghent altarpiece uh, by Jan van, uh, Jan van Eyck. Uh, it has been stolen seven times, most recently by the Nazis, and was returned and has been fully, fully restored to the cathedral in Ghent. The good, the true, the beautiful. Now, this is where I want to end, the good, the true, the beautiful. If sacred art, if the intention of that is to allow us to express creatively our creator with others. If it is our desire to imitate him, um, and you know this, I mean, if, has any artwork ever moved you in any way or to contemplate something greater than yourself, ever been moved to tears by something? We know that feeling of making that connection to the divine. I wept in front of the Last Supper after I got over how large it is. Nobody warned me it was 30 feet long. It's massive. It covers the entire wall of a refectory in, in uh, Milan. 
But I, I remember that vividly. That's the point. That's the touch of the divine. Our response to this human creative act that imitates our creator. But today, there's an intellectual and philosophical challenge that we are confronting, and not just in art, but in lots of things. It's mostly an ethical issue, is the use of artificial intelligence. Um, while a significant advance is made possible by human technology, we cannot deny it is here, the ethical concern is how we as humans now turn our creativity and ingenuity over to a force of our creation. Now a generation removed from the creator. Do you see how we turn that over? If you've never seen any artwork that's generated by artificial intelligence, go look at it. I didn't show you any this morning, and I'm not going to. There's something about the process, though, that has led many Catholics, particularly the Catholic Church, I think, leading the, the charge on this. AI can, re, can create religious images in seconds. This was a recent headline in National Catholic Register. AI can create religious images in seconds, but is it really sacred art? Social media is full of it, but they were not created from the heart of a living artist. So is it art for art's sake? Is it art for his sake? Sacred art is the work of a human being cooperating, whether he knows it or not, with a divine inspiration to create a depiction of a supernatural reality. Pope Francis recently said this, quote, while AI offers many positive benefits, I, it cannot replace the wisdom of the heart that humans can seek and receive from God alone. So I would like to leave you with that <laughs> as something to think about. Just something to think about. And then again, as I said, I'm thinking about trying to maybe offer a summer series if there's interest over a few weeknights or a few weeks. I'm not sure how we do this. But looking specifically at the high renaissance and the Baroque periods, because this is what interests me about that especially, the unlikely theologians. Michelangelo. Caravaggio, oh my God. How do irreligious people, what we might call irreligious people, create such incredible beauty of the divine? Would you talk more about their, their life and their lifestyle? Yes, yes. That's what I'm really interested in. I saw that for camera. Okay. I'll be there, I'll be there. All right. I'm sorry I ran over this morning. I hope that wasn't. Too bad, but those of you that needed to leave, I'm sure did already, so I'm not talking to you. <laughs> Any quick questions? Yes. How do you respond to a non Catholic that think that having a crucifix is having an idol? How do I respond to a non Catholic who says that having a crucifix mm -hmm. is having an idol? Well, I mean, I always respond that that is, that is why we have a Christian faith at all. It's because of what happened on that cross. It's, it's, it's equally idolatry to me to have a cross with nothing on it. That's, that's actually something I don't get asked of very often, quite honestly. Thank goodness. <laughs> Thank goodness. Because we have, we, have we have that argument, too, about, about statues in our churches. Hold on, hold on just a second. Yes. On the what? Symbolism. Oh yeah, oh, I'd love to do a series on that. Absolutely love to do that. Symbolism, just like the goldfinch. I could have talked about the goldfinch for the rest of the time, but I am a bird nerd. Anything else? Okay, thank you guys for coming, and uh, Father Rainey will get you next week.